Hey guys, it's Alicia from LBCC Historical, and today we're going to talk about cold creams. Uh, we already did a video on pomades, and that is somewhat similar. We'll talk about that again in this, but cold cream is something that we get a lot of questions about. It is very interesting in the idea that, uh, in my mind, a couple years ago, you know, with our, our great grandmas, even our grandmas, they were using it, and now it's making a comeback, but in between that time, it sort of vanished. and we have no idea like what it was or that our grandparents even used it or our great grandparents even used it. Now that it's making a comeback, we need to sort of relearn about it. So if you're watching this video, that means that you are curious about it and that you're gonna probably put it in your beauty regime, which is super important. When you think of the movie actors in the classic films, the black and white films, the early, um, color films, the musicals, their skin was flawless. Even like my grandma, she's in her late 80s and her skin is amazing. And especially to go back to those original cold cream recipes. Uh, but we have a lot of original formulas in our shop. So let's get down to business and let's talk about some cold creams. So what is cold cream? Cold cream is a label used to define a specific product these days. It's a product that is a fluffy emulsion um, it goes on your face and your skin to moisturize, to take the makeup off. But historically, it fell under a lot of names. Cold cream, although the name has floated around for centuries, isn't always what these are called. And that's where we come in with the pomades or the pomatums or the pomatums. There is also unguents. <laughs> Uh, there is also derivatives of cold cream, which wrinkle cream would fall under a derivative of cold cream. And according to our brand new pharmaceutical beauty book from the 1940s, there are three types of creams. You have cold cream, you have vanishing cream, and you have water-free creams. Again, just like in our other discussions, as time progresses, as new ingredients are found, the cold creams change. In it, But that would be an example of cold cream. It was um, a fluffy, emulsion of waters and fats. We start seeing creams being categorized into um, specific types with how they're made. Is it water into the fat? Is it fat into the water? We start seeing that happen early in the 1920s and by the 1940s um, they have specific categories of what makes a cold cream, uh, what makes a vanishing cream. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what what was the original cold cream? Like, like tell us more. <laughs> the first cold cream was attributed to Galen, who was a, a Roman physician. What Galen did is he mixed fats with waters. And if you can get the right amounts, and, and if you know how to properly work with them, you can do magic. What he basically did was he whipped it enough to form this cream. And we don't actually know, you know, what the status of the cream was, um, was it a watery cream? Was it a fluffy cream? You know, um, but the idea of him using rose water, because rose water is ancient, it's very, very old. And so the idea of combining flower waters with fats, and that is what the first cold cream or the first emulsion was. And so that is what we see. And we also see the difference in oils. The first oil probably was olive oil. Um, we're not 100% sure about that. But, uh, by the, but by the time we hit 1618 in the pharmaceutica, it tells us that the almond oil has now replaced the olive oil. And throughout history, olive oil gets different names as well. Um, history is always changing. We're always finding out more information. Um, so uh, by the 1600s, then we see a lot of almond oils. And almond oils uh, throughout history have been prevalent in cosmetics. So by the time we hit the 30s and 40s and their categorizations of what makes a vanishing cream, what makes a cold cream, they come to the conclusion that in order to have a cold cream, you have to have a water in oil. But if you do it the other way around where you have an oil in the water, then you have a vanishing cream. And so it gets very confusing. <laughs> but all you guys really have to know are the basics. And without getting into too much scientific and historical information, I wanna try and just give you the basics, but also give you guys something that you might find interesting and want to delve into more. Uh, we talked about the various names that cold cream has. So when you're looking, when you're dealing with historical recipes, you're not gonna always see it under 
cold cream. You could see it under pomade, pomatums, you could see it under um, in emulsions. In fact, we have a dispensary from 1768 in our collection and, and the cold creams, I have to read it, because when you're dealing with 18th century uh, writings, they have different letters for different things, so I have to actually like look down to read it to hopefully get it correct. Um, they don't actually specify cold creams, and interestingly enough, it's in the medicinal compositions. In fact, interesting note about this, um, cosmetics and skincare first started out as medicinal. We didn't really see the idea that it came to its own with its own label of cosmetics until the Regency period. We start seeing things kind of separate and now you have cosmetics and you have medicinals. But previous to that, all of your makeup was considered medicinal. And so that's why you see the lotions and the injections and the plasters and the ointments and the liniments and what else do they have in here? Pills, trochies, lozenges, powders. All of that stuff is in the medicinal composition portion of this early 18th century dispensary. So keeping in line with the medicinal, you guys will find this very interesting. Even though when we hit the Regency period, cosmetics change and you get your separation of medicinal and cosmetic, sometimes the lines were still crossed. And so very interesting, when Pons patented his cold cream, it wasn't patented under cold cream or cosmetics. And this was in um, 1800 to 1850. I don't remember the exact date. And it was patented under a medicine to help with the face. And so it's very interesting to see history repeat itself. And you know, here at LBCC Historical, we're all about that because that's kind of what we do on a daily basis. So I thought you guys would find that very interesting, but let's delve into it from a timeline of sorts. I have a few random uh, pharmaceuticals and medicinal books and cosmetic books that I pulled from our library. And so we'll continue with this one from this one the from 1768. And again, it's found in the medicinal components. And when we turn to the page, it's not even listed under cold creams. Cold cream doesn't even appear. Um, it's under emulsions is the first is the first like chapter heading. In the foregoing chapters, oils were united with watery liqueurs by the use of sugars and syrups into thick compounds. In the previous chapter, certain mixtures of, of oily refineness and other like bodies with water in the liquid form, a white color resembling milk and hence called emulsions. And so we found that very interesting because when we think of cold creams, most cold creams are white, right? Um, we do tend to see cold creams taking on a whole new idea and changing colors when they finally become customized to various skin ailments or various skin types. And that starts to come in in the late 20s, early 30s. They, they realized that um, not only could they possibly help people with um, you know, dry skin, oily skin, but that it was another money-making venture for the cosmetics industry to put out different types of cold creams. We start seeing cold creams change in color where this one is um, it's still a little white, but it's, you know, it's kind of got like a gray color to it because it's, even though it says cold cream, this is our 1936 cold cream, it's a mask. It's a mask, even though it's still labeled under the same. This goes on and on. And then if we turn to a section, there's, there's about like a quarter of an inch of pages related to all of these uh, emotions. Then we come and we see ungentum, rosaceum, and palmitum. It talks about the rose ointment commonly called palmitum. And so you have to refer to our palmitum uh, video for more information on that. So just like we talked about the Roman physician Galen, he probably used rose water as his first um, flower water in making the emulsions for the cold creams. And this is where we kind of get that overlap. So it talks to you of like how to take your fat and how to how to work these recipes um, vaguely because all historical recipes are very vague and you actually have to just know how to do it or what process it needs or what steps. Um, but then at the bottom it says these ointments are in common use for softening and smoothing the skin and healing chaps. And that uh, recipe was a palmitum. And then right below you have an ungentum recipe. And so ungents, palmades, cold creams. There was a time when we could just throw those all into the same category. So let's see, let's close that one. That one is a really heavy book. Let's move on. Uh, this is a 1780s manual for bathing, uh, sweet waters, preserving teeth and gums and so on and so forth. Uh, when we look at this, 
we see perfumes, pestles, pastes, pomatums. So this is listed, this cold cream, it actually does say cold cream, uh, is listed under pomatums. It says cold cream or pomatum for the complexion. And so let's just check that out. Receipt 183 talks about uh, cold creams, pomatums for the complexion. And so we're not gonna go into that, but um, just know that like it overlaps and I'm just giving you guys some examples. So uh, what is next? A 1920s book, and this is listed as face creams. It is not listed as cold creams, it's listed as face creams, and now we start getting subsections of cold creams and vanishing creams. It talks about face creams and what is popular in the 20s. It says the most popular face creams of the present day are called greaseless preparations, which are sold under various fancy names such as vanishing cream. They're a great advantage to their facility of disappearing when rubbed into the skin and leaves no greasiness behind. So now we're starting to see the separation of vanishing creams and cold creams, because cold creams um, tend to be greasy, not greasy. I mean, it feels greasy, I guess, when you first put it on, but your skin absolutely loves it, especially when it's made out of natural fats and natural oils. And so it actually sinks in pretty quickly, and that's how you get amazing, soft, skin and you're able to help fight your wrinkles. Where now they're talking about vanishing creams and that's the fad in the 20s is to have greaseless cream. That's called vanishing creams. So this is the first time we see this and it talks about these vanishing creams also have cleansing properties and leave the skin soft with a natural bloom or over, do not choke the pores and are practically devoid of mineral matter. A typical cream of this kind is made and then it talks about it. Um, we do have a vanishing cream in our shop and this is a 1930s vanishing cream. Vanishing creams are like a cousin to cold creams. You would put it on your face before you apply your makeup. Uh, it's called vanishing creams because it's it, they say it's supposed to vanish your wrinkles, vanish any sort of like little spots, uh, sunspots and things like that. But the main point of vanishing cream is to put a base between you and your cosmetics. So to help keep your skin free of all the, the cosmetics that you would put on it. You just rub a little bit in and it's very soft and fluffy. Then we flip it over and cold creams have their own section. So here now in the 20s, we have the separation of cold creams and vanishing creams. And it says cold creams. Old fashioned cold creams are still preferred by many persons who have dry skin, which need lubricating in order to make up for the deficiency of natural fats. The following are some of the best formulas for this cream. And this is also where we see mm. things like mineral oil and paraffin and the starting of Vaseline or petroleum jelly being used because those are brand new ingredients. They're exciting, they have various beauty products and they can help with certain things. And so um, where you have Galen who just used fat and water and most of the recipes up until the 20th century are mostly fat, waters and oils. And then they sort of change from there. So now let's check on the 1940s. And you have to understand between the 30s and 40s was a huge jump in the ability of chemicals in and that they were man-made products. And so um, this is gonna kind of change now too. It says cold creams are the basic creams of the cosmetic industry, although their use has been somewhat displaced in recent years by newer types of creams giving different effects. Consisting of an emulsion of mixture of oils and waxes, cold creams leave an oily film on the skin and are recommended chiefly for dry skins. Which, that used to be the case in the beginning, but cold creams also help take off makeup. So uh, not only does it take off makeup, any sort of skin type, you put your cold cream on, it's gonna help. It's gonna help it. It's great for dry skin or, or those who have dry skin because you have a lot of oils and fats, which naturally are, your dry skin is gonna like. But for those of you who have normal skin or even oily skin, you know, this, this one right here from the 30s is specifically what they said for oily skin. Some of this information is a little outdated. A good cold cream must have body and consistency of butter, must be absolutely white and give smooth uniform in appearance when cut like a knife. It goes down, down, it goes and breaks everything down. Now, that's not necessarily true because this is a 1930s cold cream and you have to shake it. There's no way you could actually cut it with a knife because it's not an emulsion like this 1930s cream where you could cut it with a knife and it would stand up just like um, whipped cream. Yeah. So the whole concept of cold creams is absolutely fascinating. And uh, we have quite a few in the shop for you guys to try. We talked about our 1930s products, you know, so we have the vanishing cream and the cold cream, amazing for um, oily skin, vanishing cream if you wear makeup. I'm gonna go in sort of an order here. Uh, we have a 1772 cold cream 
And for earlier dates, the cold cream is going to be a little bit more liquidy because you have to remember they didn't have mixers. They didn't have like emulsifying waxes that were specialty produced out of various derivatives of fats. It just wasn't as high tech, you know, it was very simple. So uh, this is like beginning of cold creams where, you know, it's your fat and your flour water. And it's just really amazing. This one is orange flour. This is from 1772. Our next one that we have is an 1822 cream of roses. And cream of roses in 1822, you had to have milk of roses, you had to have cream of roses in the Regency period, otherwise you weren't cool, like it was the infad. Uh, the next cold cream that we have is the cucumber cold cream from the Civil War. This is absolutely wonderful because it has um, organic cucumber in. Uh, so you. then we kind of jump a little bit to um, 1912, and this is so like 1912 Titanic, 1912. So this is a 1912 cold cream, and this one is really cool because it's not made with various types of tallows and fats. Mm. This one is made with cocoa butter. So if you want to try something new, it's almost like what we consider body butter today. It's pretty awesome. This one doesn't do well in the sun though. Once the sun hits it, it breaks it down and it melts. Um, you have to really stir it and it can get granuly a little bit, but at the same time, if you just work it in, it, the, the granules go away and they melt. Uh, that is the other thing with historical cold creams. Up until the 1880s, they couldn't really figure out a way to keep the emulsion together. And this is why sometimes they separate a little bit or they get a little bit runny. And all you have to do is put them in the fridge and whip them up a little bit. Uh, and that'll solve your problems. But this is one of the main issues associated with emulsions is that they couldn't keep them together. Cause if you think about waters and oils, what happens like when you put waters and oils together, right? They separate, they don't go together willingly. And so anytime there was a temperature change, the cold creams were likely to separate or likely to have like water leaking out of them. And in our shop, you will see that when you have temperature changes, especially with creams like, you know, these face creams, uh, sometimes some of the palmitums, the soft palmitums, you will see little water droplets and that's just the water separating out of the cream and that's okay. There is nothing wrong with that. All you have to do is stir it in. But then by the, by the uh, 1880s, someone figured out that if you put borax in your water solution or in your flour water solution before, you have a better chance of your emulsion, your cold cream holding together longer and not separating. It didn't catch on right away. It took a while to catch on. And then, and then they, they started create. creating other products that are not 100% natural or that are, but like, you know, petroleum products and things like that. So um, it was very interesting that step. And they were really excited because now cold creams wouldn't have the chance of separating. As we continue, we start seeing other types of creams. Now this is a uh, 1918 massage cream and it's completely cold cream consistency. Um, any of these cold creams can be used on your body, uh, but this one specifically because it has violet in is meant for massaging around the neck. And they actually had pictures in my book of photographs of showing how you're supposed to massage around the neck, which I thought was pretty amusing. And then we have this 1901 cold cream, which by far is our most popular cold cream. And this is um, a rose cold cream that has vegetable glycerin in it. And again, in 1900s, they're like, wow, vegetable glycerin, we could do so much with this, you know? So vegetable glycerin is uh, another one of those components where it, it uh, soaks up water. It can hold a lot of water. And so for emulsions, vegetable glycerin is amazing, like scientifically speaking, uh, because it, it, has less of a chance of breaking down and separating. Vegetable glycerin is also really good for your skin. Uh, it uh, helps hold the water in. And, and if you look up, like there's always a for and against. So you just have to kind of make your own decisions. But it is one of our most popular cold creams. Uh, everybody absolutely loves it and we have a hard time keeping it in stock. And so you have a lot of historical cold creams to try in our shop. And we're gonna keep adding more because I absolutely love cold creams. I use them I use them all the time. And so when you think of like early cold creams, this is a palmatum for wrinkles. This would be like a very early cold cream that is sort of a cold cream, but more of a pomade because the consistency isn't very fluffy. Um, and Sultana palmatum, all of these things are excellent, excellent for the skin. And once you guys go natural and see that the historical recipes are not what everybody has made them out to be. They're, they're not all horrible for you. Um, they're not all laced with lead and laced with arsenic and mercury. There's so many wonderful recipes. So hopefully this gives you just a glimpse into the world of cold cream. Um, 
it is absolutely fascinating, at least to me, and I could talk for hours on it. But feel free to stop at our shop, www.litt, three T's, L-E-B-I-T-S dot Etsy dot com and check out some of the cold creams for yourself. If you have any questions, feel free to email me and um, I will get to you as soon as I am able. And have a great day.